Greetings. On behalf of the Department of English at the University of Saskatchewan, welcome, everyone, welcome to My Writing Life, a conversation with Joy Kagawa. It's so wonderful to have so many of you here with us today virtually, um, as we have the honor of hosting this conversation with acclaimed author and recent honorary recipient, Joy Kagawa. My name is Jeanette Lines. I'm a professor of English at the University of Saskatchewan and director of the MFA in writing. Today's event will be recorded. I would like to begin by saying that as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Before I briefly overview the format for today's session, I'm very pleased to introduce the Dean of the College of Arts and Science, Dr. Peta Bonham-Smith. Hey, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Jeanette, for that, uh, that introduction. As Dean of the College of Arts and Science, it's my privilege to welcome you to this very special event. Uh, from coming from my home. No, not serious. During a time when our university community is physically separated, events such as these help us, help us to keep connected and stay connected. I am pleased to see so many alumni, faculty, staff, students, and friends joining us from near and far. And uh, for those who don't know, um, the, the number uh, for, uh, of attendees at, this, uh, at, the, at the talk had to be increased from the original number of 100. And I think Joanne was telling me there's 189 people uh, mm -hmm. in attendance to, today. So thank you all from wherever you are uh, for, uh, for joining us. Thank you to the Department of English and the MFA in writing for arranging this opportunity. Joy Kogawa is not only one of our country's finest authors, she is also a leader, an advocate, and an educator whose tireless work has changed Canada for the better. She was a very deserving recipient of an honorary Doctor of Letters from our university earlier this month. I'm very excited to hear more about uh, your extraordinary life. And I know that we can look forward to an insightful conversation between Joy and our own Professor Yuan Liao. With that very brief introduction, I will leave it, I will turn it back, sorry, to Professor Jeanette Lines, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dean Bonham-Smith. The format for today is a conversation with Joy Kagawa, hosted by Dr. Joanne Liao of the Department of English. After that, there will be a question period moderated by Dr. Wendy Roy, also of the Department of English. I'm so honored to introduce today's guest of honor, uh, Joy Kagawa, one of the country's most revered authors and a passionate advocate for Japanese Canadians. Joy Kagawa began her celebrated career as a writer while studying at the University of Saskatchewan in the 1960s. Although she began as a poet, her best known work is the 1981 novel, novel Obasan, which was adapted for the children's book Naomi's Road, 1986. Her contributions to Canadian society were celebrated when she was invested into the Order of Canada in 1986, earning one of the country's highest honours. Joanne Liao lives as a guest on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. She is an assistant professor of decolonizing, diasporic, and transnational literatures at the University of Saskatchewan. Her most recent research is in Positions, Asia Critique, Verge, Studies in Global Asia, University of Toronto Quarterly, and Journal of Asian American Studies. Her first book manuscript theorizes the relationship between cultural dissidence and, the, and urban planning in Singapore. Her essays, fiction, and poetry have been published in Brick, Catapult, The Goose, Isle, The Kindling, The Town Crier, QLRS, and Rice Paper Magazine. Her eco-critical SSHRC-funded project, Intertidal Polyphonies, is archived at intertidal.usask.ca. And I'll now turn the proceedings over to our conversation. 
Thanks so much, Jeanette. And hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're really, really lucky to have Joy with us today. And I do know that Joy has actually prepared a short reading to start us off. Um, so Joy, if you could please uh, grace us with the reading and then we'll start with our conversation. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see, I'll, I'll read the prologue. Um, and then a, another short excerpt. There is a silence that cannot speak. There is a silence that will not speak. Beneath the grass, the speaking dreams, and beneath the dreams is a sensate sea. The speech that frees comes forth from that amniotic deep. To attend its voice, I can hear it say, is to embrace its absence. But I fail the task. The word is stone. I admit it. I hate the stillness. I hate the stone. I hate the sealed vault with its cold icon. I hate the staring into the night, the, the questions thinning into space, the sky swallowing the echoes. Unless the stone bursts with telling, unless the seed flowers with speech, there is in my life no living word. The sound I hear is only sound, white sound. Words when they fall are pockmarks on the earth. They are hailstones seeking an underground stream. If I could follow the stream down and down to the hidden voice, would I come at last to the freeing word? I ask the night sky, but the silence is steadfast. There is no reply. I should add here that that was the beginning of Obasan, and I said there is no reply. But in my last book, Gently to Nagasaki, there was a reply. There was a freeing word. I did come full circle. I did follow the stream down and I found the hidden voice. Anyway, there was something else I was going to read. Um, <clears throat> this is um, towards the end of the book, but then it was written, this book was written in 1981 and the Issei, that is the first generation, were um, still around then, some, quite a few. And um, so as a child, when I was growing up, I kept hearing, where do you come from? What country? You, you know, I'd say, well, I'm Canadian. I was born here. And then they'd say, no, no, no. Where did you come from? Well, I was born here. I was born in Vancouver. No, I mean, um, your parents, where did they come from? So this is an answer to that question. Does it so much matter that these questions are always asked, particularly by strangers? These are icebreaker questions that create an awareness of ice. <clears throat> Where do any of us come from in this cold country? Oh, Canada. Whether it is admitted or not, we come from you, we come from you. From the same soil, the slugs and slime and bogs and twigs and roots. We come from the country that plucks its people out like weeds and flings them into the roadside. We grow in ditches and sloughs, untended and spindly. We erupt in the valleys and mountainsides and small towns and back alleys. Sprouting upside down on the prairies, our hair wild as spiders' legs, our feet rooted nowhere. We grow where we are not seen. We flourish where we are not heard. The thick undergrowth of an unlikely planting. Where do we come from, Wasan? We come from coat cemeteries full of skeletons with wild roses in their grinning teeth. We come from our untold tales that wait for their telling. We come from Canada, this land that is like every land, filled with the wise, the fearful, 
the compassionate, the corrupt. Obasan, however, does not come from this clamorous climate. She does not dance to the multicultural piper's tune or respond to the racist slur. She remains in a silent territory defined by her serving hands. She serves us now, pouring tea into Mr. Barker's cup. She's unable to see and stops halfway before the cup is full. You know, when I wrote that, I didn't realize that it was the custom not to make the cup full, to make it half full. And uh, so if I had known that, I would have taken that last line out. But, you know, we learn these things as we go along. We, sometimes when I've written something um, and I don't know what it means and I found out later, or somebody else tells me what it means and then I know. It's very funny about writing. It's, um, and, and that makes me trust the writing more, the fact that I don't know what I've written until afterwards. So anyway, a little short reading. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, you know, I wish we were in person because I'm sure what would happen now would be applauding. And I can hear it. I can hear it. I could almost hear it. <laughs> and thank you so much for reading the prologue of Obasan. Um, it is really such an honor to hear you read from that groundbreaking and historic work. Um, and I just wanted to start by thinking about what you said in your convocation speech uh, when you received the honorary doctorate of letters here at the University of Saskatchewan. And you said that at one point in your life, you stopped living to write and started writing to live. Yeah. And it really, um, that really struck me. And I wanted to ask you, what does that mean for you right now? What are you right writing, what are you working on now? And what, what does the day look like for you in writing? Well, if I can just go back for a minute to where I was when I made that statement. Mm -hmm. um, when I was, um, you know, I had been for years trying to write. And so I was living to write. And so at a certain point, there was a crisis in my life. And I really had to know what the answer was. So I was no longer living to write. But my writing changed at that point. It became a real spade, a tool, an axe, whatever it is that gets you there. When you're going up the mountain, you pick axe and you pull yourself up with a rope. And that's what writing became for me. And that was in 1964 when I lived in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. That's when writing started for me. Mm. And I was, then I was, I had to know the answer. What was the point of it all? I, I was going through such a crisis and you know, I, I was testing everything. I thought, here I am trying to, trying to love. And no matter what I do, I do not love the person I'm supposed to love, which is my husband. And um, I, so it, there was this crisis. There was a, it was a emotional, psychological, but also a spiritual crisis in that here I had prayed so hard and I had trusted so hard and I had done my best and I could not love. So that was what that crisis was hmm. in 1964 when I was living in Moose Jaw. And so um, with that big question, why can't I love love, I started to go into my dreams. And um, I, I thought, I can't figure it out, but the unconscious can do that. And so I said, I'll hold this pen by my desk, by, beside my bed. And if I wake up and there's a dream, I'll write it down. And then in the morning when I woke up, there was a poem. It, it was written as a poem. So I thought, well, that's interesting. The unconscious is full of poetry and you know, imagery and so on. So that started me altogether. That from that point on, poems just poured out of me, you know. And they could have, I could have uh, just turned around and there'd be another poem. It was like that. The Im imagery was so fast and furious in those days. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's so does, no, that, that's amazing. So you turn around and then the poem kind of comes to you. That, what a beautiful yeah. image in, in and of itself. And does that, what, what do you do? What are you working on right now? What does a typical day of writing look like for you, um, well, having gone through that crisis? Yeah, and, well, um, in those days, since the stuff was there trying to get through, my task was just to sweep the way clear. That is to get get the debris out of the way and let the stuff come. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
I've never been a conscious type of writer. That is a person who thinks first and acts. I've always been somebody that learns by hindsight. And um, whether it's writing or not, it's, it's the, the biggest word, I guess, for me is, was trust. I will mm -hmm. trust what is coming forward. Mm -hmm. and, or I will trust the process. Or I will trust um, whatever is called reality. You know, Doug Hammarskjöld's statement, um, for all that has been, yes, for all that will be, thanks. Mm -hmm. No, it's the other way around. For all that has been, thanks. For all that will be, yes. yes. And um, so, and, and the, that's an attitude of trust for what is happening and what is going to happen and you will welcome whatever it is that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the process for me, not just of writing, but of life itself. And, you know, here I am, 85 years old, so I'm, you know, on my way out <laughs> from as far as this planet is concerned. And, and the best thing is to go with a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. Trust the universe, to trust. Actually, it's the arc of good. That is what I trust, that we're on this arc and we are headed towards the good. And um, I trust that. I trust in, in um, the essential good. I trust in um, the undergirding of love for everything, no matter what it looks like, I will hold that. I do trust that. I grew up with that. And, and there were horrible things in my family and in my life and just, it was all horrible and nuts a, a lot of the time. Um, and, and it wasn't in a lot of the time too, but I trusted. I always, I, I've always trusted. And um, I think from the very beginning, my mom taught me to pray and I prayed. Mm -hmm. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that a lot of us probably in this moment, in our contemporary moment, in this time of history, really needed to hear you say that, um, that you believe in the arc of goodness um, and, and, and the hope that you carry. Um, I want to turn back to that image that you first gave us where you turn around and there's that poem coming, waiting to come out. You've really moved in your career between prose and poetry, um, between memoir and fiction, and really written in, in you know, a multitude of genres. And I would like to hear a little bit more about perhaps first that difference between prose and poetry for you. Um, do, is there a boundary, a line, a difference? Well, you know, it's, it's a process I, in how this writing comes to. What was that? Or am I talking? It was, it was an echo or something. It feels like um, there is an excess of emotion and it feels like, um, you know, um, if there's a radiator and it's got an excess there, you have to open the safety valve and let it go shoot out or else, you know, you can see the whole thing exploding. And, and, and that's what it feels like to me that I've got so much emotion and, and, and it requires that safety valve. So the pen is my safety valve. And when, it, um, when the imagery is just so thick there, and the pen has to capture it and it goes like that. So the difference then between a poem and a poem coming out and fiction and fiction coming out is the difference between a spark, a really big spark maybe, or just sparks and a swamp fire. There's, they're both light, but one is long and it's thick and it's um you know boggy and it, but it's a swamp and and you you but it's on fire as well you know the the whether it's fiction or whether it's poetry it has to have the primacy of one's emotions that's that's the steam within the radiator is your feelings so i think i don't know why i think somehow my emotions were protected from not shutting down Sometimes if we hurt too much, we say, ah, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to feel anything. I'd rather feel nothing than hurt like this. So I would say, don't do that. Run into the midst of the fire. Don't run away from it. There was, um, there was um, a fairy tale I remember reading as a child when I was in Slocan about, um, you know, you, you would come to this puddle of water 
And if you didn't jump, it would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon you were paralyzed and you couldn't. Or if you came to this a place that had some thorns and you hesitated, it would become unbelievably big. Or if you stopped in front of an animal that seemed like it was going to scare you, and it would then, it becomes so big that you couldn't do it. So there, although it's sometimes foolish to jump like that, um, it's also important to risk mm. and, and not to just make sure everything is safe before you can act. Hmm. You just yeah. take your chances and go, you jump over. It could send you down the cliff to your death. You know that, you know, it's terrifying and, it, but, what I have found when I jump over the cliff is that there are always nets there and the net will lift you up to higher ground. Hmm. For some reason that's been my experience. So I'm still alive, you know. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> no, those are amazing answers. I mean, spoken like a real writer, all these metaphors and kind of images in my head now. Um, so really this idea of the pen as a safety valve is very compelling. Um, and I do know that in your, in your memoir work, but also in your fiction work, like you've said, because of those um, difficult episodes in your life, those challenging episodes in your life, in your family, you've really had to confront a lot of difficult, many difficult issues and many difficult topics, especially in, in a very personal way. So I suppose my question would be, what is that like navigating between the boundary of memoir and fiction? Well, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's interesting, but I think you have to not be afraid of what the work is doing. You just have to trust it and let it go. And you have to hold, um, well, my, my mother was like this. She was the most truthful person I've ever met. And um, you have to not be afraid of that. You have to, uh, truth has to be held there, but it has to be with love. I mean, they have to belong together. And um, I think they meet, truth and love meet in forgiveness. And um, that's what I've been working on recently. I think, I think that was one of your questions, that I am working on forgiveness, not, not just to write about it, um, but to live it, to understand it. And what I know is that to err is human, to forgive divine, so we cannot. But what I've discovered is that you can intend you can intend to forgive, even if you can't forgive. And that's good enough. Because when you intend to forgive, then the door to forgiveness opens from the other side. And as it opens, you'll see the wedge of light coming through and you'll receive the gifts of that intention so that your life gets so filled up by the gifts that come through that opening doorway that's coming from the other side that the capacity to forgive is then enabled. Um, you, you get so full of gratitude that the, the, the pain that they had to be forgiven is dissipated. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's been my discovery. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really grateful for that because I'm on the search for forgiveness because I think I need it, others need it, the world needs forgiveness people who hate each other, I think if they could say, you know, my best friend is hidden within this enemy. I have to wait till I can see the best friend because if I don't, I could kill my best friend. So, so there's a kind of trusting and waiting and believing and having faith that there is the good and that as you seek the good, the good will come to you. Mm -hmm. And in that process, crossing in between writing about your personal life and your personal history, in that, but also in, in moving, uh, fictionalizing some things also to work through it. I, I really do think that in your writing, you really try to confront this idea, I think, of, of forgiveness. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, coming back to Obasan, um, you know, that sort of groundbreaking work that has done so much in your own activist work that has done so much for Japanese Canadians. What do you think is that relationship between your individual work with thinking about forgiveness, thinking about like personal history and collective history that obviously is also very, very apparent in your writing. Um, what, what is that interplay between, you know, 
telling your family's story, telling your story, but then also, you know, thinking of the Japanese Canadians as a community that needed to have this collective history told as well. Well, I think every single person is part of a collective of some kind. They come from some story. And every one of those stories, even if you say, look, the English writers, they've covered it, got England covered. We don't need more of those. But that's not the case. I think that no matter where we come from, no matter if those stories have been told and told and told, there's always more. There's never um, a surfeit, an ending to any, any, any person or any group's story. So, um, what was your question now? <laughs> <laughs> My question is, you know, like, what is, what do you think is that relationship between a kind of larger story and the movement towards redress and um, the tragedy of internment and the crime of internment, really, and the personal? Like, how do you see those two things working together in your writing? Because, uh, well, I, in my writing, it is, you know, uh, the particular story of my of my particular group of people, and it doesn't have to be an ethnic group, it could be any other kind of group, but one belongs to many kinds of collectives. And um, I think any, it's like DNA, you touch any part of your DNA and you get the whole picture. So mm -hmm. any person has, um, is connected to everything, connected to their own family, their own friends, their own ethnic community, the whole planet to the universe and you 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 know our connections are are i mean in 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 some way we're all of us indivisibly together mm -hmm. and, and connected so anybody's deepest story is everybody's deepest story you know uh, yeah no that's really beautiful this idea i think especially in this moment where everyone seems to be sort of polarizing like you were saying and dividing each other up by certain things this idea that you also see your work as a means of this greater connection um, is I think a really important thing for us to take away I want to turn um, very specifically to one to, to a line of poetry that you wrote um, and then think about you know and, and, and I want to ask you about like that those images in your in your work was one of the lines of your point one of the lines of your poetry that's really stayed with me ever since I first read it was I have a house in the shadows now and I have and have learned to eat minerals straight from stone yeah. and for some reason that has really you know it's from your 1985 poem minerals from stone and it strikes me that so much of your work um, in your prose in your poetry has this grounding in a very physical and material way in landscapes and objects. And I was, I was just wanted to hear you talk a, more, a bit more about this. And even just talking to you now, I've been struck by how, you know, you make something so abstract, like forgiveness or writing poetry, and you turn it into something so concrete and physical, like a radiator. So what, what draws you to the everyday object and the like landscape or this idea of making, you know, learning to eat minerals straight from stone? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I think, um, you know, magpies, magpies go around and they gather little bits of straw and little bits of string and they make their nests up that. And I think um, a writer, a, a bit like a magpie, you just um, use the material that you're familiar with, whatever it is, and that becomes part of your nest or you're part of your weaving, your hair becomes straw or whatever, you know. Um, Everything is connected to everything, so you can always make that connection, whatever it is. And the more challenging it is, the more interesting it can be. <laughs> you know, see <laughs> how you get mineral from stone, you know. Yeah. Um, well, um, stone is filled with minerals, and <laughs> you can't eat the stone, it'll kill you. But you can find the meaning within anything, and you can discern meaning around you no matter what it is and you can make it palatable you can make it edible you can make it small you can cover it with ketchup or whatever you want to do to make it edible 
No, I think that's amazing. But I have to say, um, you overestimate a bunch of us. I think we need your vision, a poet's poetry's vision, um, poetry's metaphors in order to make those connections. Um, I want to talk a little bit more. I, I know I'm, we're going to open it up to uh, audience questions in, you know, uh, five to 10 minutes or so. But I did want to ask you a couple more questions um, to draw on your wisdom. Um, you know, to think about first what it was like starting out as a writer from a kind of racialized community, a minority community in Canada in the 60s and 70s. Um, what was that like? And in your opinion, you know, going through the decades, what has been the most significant change for writers of color in Canada? Mm, for writers of color. I, I um, you know, when I was a child living in Slocan, um, my parents had brought the Book of Knowledge and that that was that in the Bible were my source for everything that came after, and so um, I never, never ever thought of myself as a writer of color. <laughs> I was just writing about my life, and it happened to be um, an Asian Canadian category, and. Um, I mean, I didn't, it didn't have to be. I could have been a white person. In the beginning, when I was first writing, I did write about white people because that's the only thing I ever read. And so my first short story was called Are There Any Shoes of Heaven? I mean, first published short story, I think. Yeah, and, um, and it was about a family called the Parkins family. And it was, again, about a man and his son, grandson, you know. <laughs> I was writing about what uh, was familiar to me that got into print, which is white men and their families and their stories. So I, was, I wrote about the Parkins. But the thing is that the Parkins had lived in the mountains and then they were living on the prairies. That's a Japanese Canadian story. We were put from Vancouver into the mountains and then many of us were sent to the sugar beet fields and the life on the prairies and so on. So. Although I wrote about the Parkins, I was writing a Japanese Canadian story. <laughs> um, yeah. So we can't get away from, um, although we can use imagination, we can write science fiction, we can write, you know, all kinds of things about things that seem to have no relationship with one's life. But whatever we have imbibed and learned in our minds and in our hearts, that'll come out. And um, some way or another, and you'll you'll see the connection as to where that came from. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be from something you've read, something you've imagined, something you've dreamed about, something you've lived in mm -hmm. some way, and your friends, and who they were, and how you felt about them. All that'll get in there in some way. You'll see the connection, even if it's you know, fantasy. But no, maybe I didn't answer your question because I can't remember what it was. <laughs> The second part of my question, no, you answered the first part of the question perfectly. The second part of the question was whether you saw a shift, a gradual shift in the way um, writers of color were being received in, in, um, in Canada, whether um, there was a shift in the ways um, or, or whether there were challenges in the, the beginning in getting published because uh, you, you're Japanese Canadian, um, you know, was there like a change? Oh, I remember when I first wrote Wasan. It wasn't called the Wasan. Um, I think it was. I think I wanted to call it Down the Noonday Street or something or something, whatever it was. Um, but when I first wrote it, uh, it got rejected by everybody. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and they said, "Well, you know, it's interesting. It's well written, but nobody will publish it. Nobody will read it." So they thought that because it wasn't traditional stuff, that is white male stuff, I wouldn't be read. So I got rejected by everybody except by Louise Dennis of Lester Harp and Dennis. She was, um, I don't know, she, she is an amazing woman. And um, so she saw the book when nobody else did. And um, so she wanted me to take it back into myself for another year or half a year or whatever, however long she took. 
I can't remember what she wanted me to do with it. She just wanted me to go back into it. So I did. And I don't know what I changed, but um, it was accepted by that small press. And then from Lester North and Dennis, it went to Penguin. Mm. And um, so they made a mass market book out of it. Mm -hmm. And it won awards. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I remember the first award that it got. It was um, Books in Canada, I think, first novel award. I remember being in this big auditorium, and I had to get up. I was so nervous, and I stood up there and I couldn't say anything. So I said, "Well, I've never won an award before," and then I sat down, <laughs> and that was it. Um, no, I, I mean, I really do think that that moment must have been so powerful. And I think that your book, um, you know, still resonates with so many writers in Canada right now who, you know, are, I, I suppose, are occasionally still told, um, no one's going to read that. We can't publish it. And to hear yeah. that story from you yeah. and knowing how important this book is, um, is you know, in some ways very frustrating, like that you would encounter that response. But also I'm so glad that, you know, that it was published and we did get to read it. Um, I, I, I know, yeah. I, I'm just saying, you know, I, I hope Louise hears this somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I really owe her. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm sure she, I, yeah. Um, I want <laughs> to think about, I, I, I see we're getting some questions in the Q&A, but I do have one more question, um, you know, before we perhaps break and, and see what the audience members have to say. But in this moment, and you shared so much about um, the history of writing uh, for you and your process and that hope that you have, um, what are you reading now? And, you know, you know, what do you think it might be important to read now um, in this moment of great crisis? Um, you know, when I was a child, I read so much. I read all the time, all the way through high school. I read and read and read and read and read and read everything I could find. Then I got to um, the first year in Calgary at um, a teacher's training course, actually. And I was told to read these really boring things. And I can say, I have never read since. <laughs> I mean, I do sometimes force myself to try. Mm -hmm. and the last thing that I did read, I just happened to have it, was Sandra Martin's book, A Good Death. Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's right on the topic of assisted dying. And I'm really interested in that at this stage <laughs> in my life. But, um, I think I always have been, because I'm really anti-suffering, you know. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, yeah, so the last thing that I read was Sandra Martin's book. Mm. And, um, William Deverell sent me his, a copy of his book, Stung. I saw it, I just opened it a bit, and it was really grabs you and, and makes you want to read it, you know. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet, but I, I'm sure I will because it's, it's one of those things that grips you right away. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so what am I saying? I, 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 I yes, dif the difficulty of reading post, uh, I, I'm going to blame that University of Calgary course now for <laughs> <laughs> ruining your, your love of reading. And thank God it didn't ruin your love of writing. So, you know, otherwise you'd be all the poor, all the poorer for it. So um, that's really good to know. Um, I do see that we, I invite you, the audience members, to put in a question in the Q&A. Um, okay. If you have questions for Joy, um, and I'm, we're so uh, sort of honored to have her uh, for a little while longer. Um, so, you know, to, to be able to answer these questions. But when, while we're waiting for perhaps one or more, two, uh, one or more questions there, um, I just sort of wanted to recall that speech that you made uh, in Convocation one last time when you thanked the Retirees Association of the University yeah. of Saskatchewan, which I thought was amazing. Um, but then you spoke so eloquently about aging. And about like you know uh, about like growing old, um, but also you know sort of finding one's place um, in this in this in this time in your life of age. And I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that um, because you you seemed 
so thrilled with the Retirees Association and this kind of collective of older people um, caring yeah. about writing and caring about um, your work. You know those pictures where, um, I forget who the painter was, but there's a whole bunch of dogs and crowds and the dogs all looking at each other. <laughs> so I think, you know, when you become identified in some way, you look for each other. So these days, I'm really interested in the struggles of people who are old, like me. And, um, and, uh, and I feel very fondly towards old people because it's a time of tremendous vulnerability. And if, and if there are regrets, that can be horrible. And um, so, um, for me, aging, I, I was thinking of writing something called the long goodbye or the slow goodbye, because I have known of people who got dementia and, um, and that's kind of a long, slow goodbye. And I have a friend, I was writing over her um, and she fell into dementia and she got taken over by somebody and it just, killed me to see her suffering from this takeover and being pushed out of her home and, and oh, all this horrible stuff. But, so you were asking me what, what were you asking? About, <laughs> no, no, you were, you were talking about it. Um, you know, kind of focus and, and I think also in a positive way, you were talking about in your speech about aging, about this kind of collectivity of older people, sharing your wisdom in many ways that we're so, um, happy to hear uh, from you and to, to, to listen to things that we, I suppose, um, do not have the experience of. And I think that's what your work really has contributed. And to, to feel that kind of collectivity that you're saying with the community of people who are aging, but also to acknowledge not to, I think in some senses, not to shun um, this idea of aging, but also to, to kind of welcome the wisdom and experience it gives. And that's what the sense I got from your speech yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. I, I do think it's, I mean, whatever is, is, you know, the diagram mm -hmm. I mentioned. And I think to be able to say yes to whatever is, is happening. I mean, suffering, we need to do everything we can to, um, to deal with suffering. I mean, if we must suffer, let there be love, let there be meaning, let there be tenderness, let there be love. Love. There, there are four words that, um, well, five words that I use like accounting. Love, trust, forgiveness, guidance, and, and gratitude. And gratitude feels like the really important word to have at the end of all those other words. And they are like counting words for me. And uh, at this stage in my life, I, uh, it's kind of like a, 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 an underground mantra, part of the underground stream, love, trust, forgiveness, guidance, gratitude. And um, I, uh, I fall back on, on that and um, especially, especially gratitude. Um, this, um, to be guided, to be filled with gratitude at this stage in life, I don't know what's better than to feel that, to feel that, oh, it's just so great to be here. It's so great to have been here. It's so great to have been given the gift of consciousness that connects us. It's, it's a, a, what a gift that the universe gave us to enable us to, to be this alive and to be conscious. It's, um, I am deeply grateful for that. For that gift. Oh, thank you. And I know, I know there are many in the audience, including myself, who really need to hear this at this moment where I think there is quite a bit of despair in the great changes that have taken place. And I'm so, so grateful that you've taken this time to speak to us. I do know we have, I think, four questions in the Q&A. So I'll let Wendy uh, choose um, her fancy and read um, a few to us so that you can answer them. Yes, thank you so much. I hope, can you hear me, Joanne? Yes. And, yes, good. I can. Good. And so I'm going to just read, uh, read the first question um, and just encourage other people to put their, their, their uh, questions in the, um, in the Q&A part rather than the chat. So the first one's from Angela May, who writes, I'm a mixed white, non-white, gose, fifth generation, Japanese-Canadian, emerging writer, scholar, and activist. 
I'm also quite involved in the Japanese Canadian community, particularly in Vancouver, and particularly in the Powell Street neighborhood in the present day downtown east side. For these reasons, like anyone who does all of these things, I'm caught up uh, in a lot of community sludge, uncomfortability and awkward leftovers. Often it is tiring, but I can't stop doing this work. So I'm wondering, since we have to imagine futures before us, sorry, futures before we can make them, Joy, how do you envision the future for our community, including but not limited to how it gets expressed on the page? Not limited to how it's expressed on the page. Um, I think we're disappearing and that's okay. I mean, if you look at the children of my generation, um, we were in a stage of being disappeared across the country. And I think that, it, and the people of, of the Nisei, the second generation, it was deeply in us to disappear, to be disappeared. And so that the intermarriage rate was very high. And so most of the children of intermarriage look very white. Some do not, even some you can tell that they're mixed. But my grandchildren, which are mixed, um, they don't look Japanese hardly at all to me when I look at them. Um, so I think that within the generation, the, the children from Japan will look Japanese, but not Japanese Canadian children. I think they will all look white. I mean, the, my, my, my grandchildren, I, you know, if you saw them, you would wonder, you know, you wouldn't think Japanese at all, I don't think. Um, and so, um, so I think the future as far as um, the Japanese Canadian line is concerned is we will have disappeared. And unless, unless there, uh, as there does seem to be some interest in them, um, they're particularly interested in the Japanese connection and in the Japan connection. My, my grandchildren from Canada um, went to Japan and they loved it there and they don't look Japanese. But I think that uh, there was something, I mean, because they say that um, much of culture disappears, even language disappears, but food doesn't, they say. Food will go on down through the generations. There's something about eating and so they love Japanese food. And, um, and they, that's what they loved in Japan was the Japanese food. I, I found that quite interesting um, to think uh, how basic that is. Mm. And there's something I think to be said as well, what you're saying as well, the more expansive um, definitions of uh, communities in some ways that you're speaking to. Um, I think that in, I mean, I'm from Asia originally, so the idea of who is Japanese, um, you know, will expand, I think, um, as we sort of go along. So that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'll let Wendy continue speaking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, well, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, can, I can, you can keep going if you want. I can ask another question. Um, there's a question from Kai. Uh, and yeah. it's about, uh, there's a question from Kai about forgiveness. How can you how can you forgive someone when they don't understand the harm they've caused? Is the question that's asked. Um, I think with forgiveness, truth has to go with it. It has to be part of the, the whole thing. But I think the benefit of forgiveness belongs with the forgiver. And the the benefit is a lightened heart. If you do not forgive, you walk around with this weight this heaviness, this anger, this hatred, and that damages yourself. If, however, you have forgiven, you walk around with lightness and light, and, um, and that is healing, not, well, primarily first for yourself and then for the others. It, forgiveness is a wonderful healing tool, but it benefits the forgiver the most. So, um, but I don't know if I answered your question because I can't remember. I've got a short-term memory loss. I forget the questions. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, so there's another question um, from uh, uh, an anonymous attendee about, uh, about being nervous. Joy, you spoke about being nervous when you won your first award. And now here today, you're so relaxed. <laughs> Have you slowly become more comfortable over time with your public self? 
What is that like for you to have this kind of wonderful public presence? It's, um, it's, it's, it's so interesting how that developed. I mean, I was not comfortable speaking publicly at all. I can remember the first time I did, I walked onto the stage and I walked right off. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's the way it was. I was so nervous and so unat home. But um, after a while, it got so, I mean, there was this thing in Victoria, I think it was, Congress uh, of the Humanities. And I went there without a thought. <laughs> and uh, because that's the way it's become over time is just to trust it. Whatever it is that's going to be said is going to be said and let it come. So without pre-thinking, I found that the best way is not to pre-think and just sort of, and not to prepare and not to think, uh, you know, not to sort of say, oh, no, no, no. That, that just makes everybody nervous, especially yourself. So, you know, it's sort of, what, well, what the heck? If it, uh, if it bombs, it bombs. And so, you know, I, of course I can't, I, I, I feel terrible when it has bombed, but, but um, well, anyway, whatever. <laughs> so, this is one of those whatever things. <laughs> And it's a great way to be actually I think it's uh, your life is a lot lighter when you're when you um well I do care I do care if it's uh, really horrible but <laughs> uh, maybe you don't have to that much anyway yeah thank you um so that and, and and you have been really you are very relaxed and that's wonderful to see um there's a question uh from John Aylward um and it's about uh risk in writing Joy, you mentioned that it's important to risk with writing. My colleagues and I recently had a discussion about Caucasian writers depicting important turning points in Indigenous history through poetry. Given recent events, how does one best risk writing outside of one's given cultural identity, and is it even still possible? Well, there's a lot of judgment about that, so it makes it um, difficult to tread where angels ought not and um you know and to respect a person's sense of ownership of what their story is and they don't want anybody else to have that right to tell it um i think it it, it just speaks to us of need for sensitivity because who wants to harm anybody and um but then the person who says i own this story and you may not have it that's um that's an effort to have power. And if a person has so little power, that's the only thing they have. You cannot blame somebody for home, hanging on to whatever power there is. But I think that real power is letting go of power. That um, you say, okay, so if I let go of power, they, they'll run right, rush out over me and destroy me. You know, if you feel like that, I would say, go there, go there to the fear. What is that fear? right with, into that fear. Um, you know, I think that when the train goes up the hill and it's a steep hill, it needs two engines, one in the front and one behind. The engine in the front needs to be love. The engine behind has to be anger. And they have to be on the same train going in the same direction for that long train to get up that hill. But it has to be love that's leading it. So what is it you love and what is it, well, and how do you, how do you express that love? Um, I think that's what you have to ask yourself when you go running into the fire, when you go into the place that hurts, when you risk and you don't know where you're going to fall. All these things require a lot of risk and a lot of trust. And, um, and I think for you to actually jump, you have to be so um, overwhelmed inside yourself with the, with the pressure and the power of what it is that wants to, needs to, get out of there, the steam, <laughs> get the steam out, you know, so you, so, so there's no choice in a way, um, because the, the pressure is so great. Thank you. And um, I'm going to uh, uh, read a couple of just comments and then, a, and then a question. Um, so from Veronica, uh, no, sorry, Vernonka, Vernonka. Thank you for everything, Joy Kagawa. Opasan changed my life by teaching me about the power of art to transform the Canadian national imaginary 
And thank you, Joanne, for this beautiful conversation. And I'm going to also read uh, from Liz Marshall. Liz Marshall, not a question, a comment from Liz. The, Liz current, the current writer in residence at the historic oh, yeah. Joy Kagawa House in Vancouver. <laughs> I would like Joy to know that I'm sitting at the desk in her childhood hood room, and it is a glorious day, a clear sky. Finally, after days of rain, so many birds come and go from the backyard. I'm honored to be here. I love Joy's gift of language and her way of seeing the world. So that's just a comment. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> um, a couple more questions here. Um, one is a question. Um, what is your gratitude to the Issa or our, our, our ancestors? This is from uh, someone who's not keeping themselves anonymous. Yeah, the Issa themselves were people of great gratitude. And so I'm grateful for their gratitude, you know. It's, um, what a gift that is. I think it's the greatest gift that we can have as we journey our way through, you know. And especially, especially at the end. If we have gratitude at the end, then our life, whatever it's gone through, has been worth it. And it's, we've learned from it and it's been good. So gratitude is a sign of um, a life well lived, I think. And, um, and coming through, coming through, there's that book, Coming Through Slaughter. That's my Kondachi's book, isn't it? It's a good love title. Um, yeah, uh, but gratitude makes, makes uh, it, it is like a glow that, that shines. It's, I, can, I think it's the halo, because that's gratitude. If your life is filled with gratitude, you'll have a light around you. And people will see that, whether they can see it or not. So there's a related question uh, from Susan uh, Des Moines, and I, I think I can answer it, actually. It's repeat the third of your five guiding words. It's, it's love, trust, forgiveness, guidance, and gratitude. Right? Great. <laughs> okay. okay, so, um, and then there's a, there's a question from um, Kim Bugless. What might you hope in this time and place are Obasan's most poignant takeaways for multicultural high school students studying this work. What is the most important takeaway? Yeah, takeaways for multicultural high school students ah. studying Obasan. Well, you know what I think is the, the problem of what happened to Japanese Canadians was that because we were not known. If you know somebody fully, you will love them fully. So it's a matter, I mean, the, the urban centers have a lot of different people in them. And so the urban centers are blessed in that way. But it's, um, you know, if you look at the United States and the red and the blue states, it's all red in the middle because um, they're not urban places as much. And I think you, if you don't know people, you will not love them. So um, it's important to always welcome the stranger, whoever the stranger is, whoever they are. And when you get to know the stranger, your life expands and it explodes. It, um, it becomes, um, you, could, you, cannot, you cannot know somebody and, and have animosity there as well. You, you, you need to know them so fully that the animosity disappears, dissolves and you see the friend within the enemy, within the stranger. Thank you, and I think we're getting close. We still have a number of um, questions from uh, audience members, but we're getting close to the end of our, uh, our um, event here. And so I'm just, um, just maybe would turn it over to you and see if you want to answer one or more question or if, if we should just turn it back to Joanne for, uh, for a wrap up. How are you doing, Joy? Mm -hmm. I'm fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'm fine. It's in, it's in your hands. Oh, there's so there are many. I, I know uh, we won't get to unfortunately all the questions. I think Wendy in the chat, but I do, I do see one from Heather Midori Yamada. Um, okay. Both a comment and then a question, uh, which I think that both both. Hey Siri, stop. <laughs> <laughs> So, so basically, um, afterward, I can, there, there are some just greetings from a few people that I can tell you about afterward. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll just ask that one last question uh, from Heather, and that's, how do we reconcile historical atrocities committed by our ancestors mm -hmm. in Japan? Yeah. How do we come to terms with them? Well, I think that there is a difference between the people, the persons, the groups, the countries that do things, and those who are associated with the guilty. Those who are associated with the guilty are not themselves guilty. But if you carry the guilt of um, an association that um, doubles the weight for the guilt, uh, I, I think that the person who is associated with it has a task and a calling and a job of um, holding um, the harmer and the harmed together in ways that neither can do with each other, but there's somebody in the middle. So that's the role of the person who is associated with the guilty. I have a big job on my back because I cannot cut off from those who are harmed by those that I love. And then that requires one to be a bridge. You can walk away from it, but to walk away from a calling and from a task is to walk away from an, opp an opportunity to, do, to be part of what is good, to be on that arc towards the good. We should all be on that arc towards the good and more conscious we are of it, the greater the good will come to us, I think. I think. <laughs> thank you. And thank so thank you so much for answering all these questions and also to all of the, the attendees who, who uh, so thoughtfully um, mm -hmm. posed questions for you uh, after, after your talk. So I'm now going to turn it back to, to Joanne. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy, for uh, fielding those questions. And um, thank you so much, Joy, for saying, especially the last response. I speak as actually the descendants, I suppose. My grandmother was in Southeast Asia. We came from Singapore and the Japanese did occupy um, the island of my birth. But yet here we are today, 2020, with you on one screen and me across the other, um, yes. bound together by, you know, ancestral histories of the, of the wars but yeah. still here and having this conversation. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us, sharing your time and your knowledge. It has been such a great honor um, to speak, I mean, sadly, across so many miles. I, <laughs> I dearly wish like, you know, I could, that I could hold your hand and thank you so much for your time. But I do know that many audience members and uh, panelists as well, we're so grateful for you taking, um, speaking of gratitude, so grateful for you taking um, this time with us, this hour with us. And if you'd like to say anything else, I invite you at this moment just to, you know, if you want to speak to the over a hundred attendees that we have here, um, if you would like to say any last words. The day, I hope the day comes when um, we can gather again. We're in, the, in this strange time where we're separated except for technology. And um, so I, I wish I could say hi to everybody and see the faces and, you know, I, I hope that day comes and um, before I'm gone <laughs> from this world. I mean, I, I've really, truly enjoyed this conversation and, and your questions and, and your thoughtfulness and um, whoever people are that are whatever, you know, thanks. It's been fun. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, this is at the end of the webinar. I'd like to thank very much as well uh, our uh, Department of English in University of Saskatchewan and also to Ter Gebeza, our graduate student who's been running the technical show behind the scenes, and to Diana Tiefenkamp, our office coordinator, who sets so much of this publicity up as well. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're sort of going to shut down for a little bit now um, and let you leave. Um, we will save some of your questions that, that we've had here for Joy to peruse at a later date. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to spend um, this you know, afternoon with us. Thank you. It's been fun.